Life on exoplanets just got a bit more likely. I'm Eric Malachite, and today on Science Get, we're talking about I-7, what it is, what it means for life on water worlds. As we've mentioned in our James Webb Space Telescope videos, ocean worlds are worlds located both in and outside the solar system that scientists are keeping a keen eye on. And the reason for that is that they have the slightest of chances to be habitable, and might even harbor extraterrestrial life. James Webb will be spending a small portion of its time observing moons like Europa, which have a high likelihood of featuring a subsurface ocean beneath their icy surfaces. Most experts agree that where there's water, there is the potential for life, but apparently that also includes ice. Not, not that kind. Wait, have we not covered how absolutely bonkers water really is? Yeah, I, I guess we have it. So there are about 17 different forms of ice. Let's take a crash course through them so we have a better idea of what I-7 is and why it's so important to the search for life. We all know the chemical formula for water. Water molecules are made up of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Pretty much every chemical that can be formed from the elements on the periodic table has one solid form, but water is a major exception. There are around 17 possible forms for water in a solid state. What we refer to as ice here on Earth is known as ice one. Ice one takes a crystalline form and requires for the water molecules making up the structure to be neatly bonded to each other. All ice on Earth is like this. Well, at least if we're not counting stuff in labs or things that might still be undiscovered in Earth's hidden depths. What's interesting and very weird about water molecules is that they form what's known as a tetrahedron. Mm. <sighs> if you're asking what the hell a tetrahedron is, well, you've seen them in real life. In geometry, these structures are made up of four vertex corners, six straight edges, and four triangular faces. Sound familiar? Yeah, we're basically talking about pyramids. The molecules in the structure want to keep their distance from each other. Oxygen will be in the center of the pyramidal structure, while the hydrogen atoms and two electrons will take up the top and bottom parts of the structure. The thing about these pyramid-like structures is that they can fit together in a bunch of different ways. And two ways that you can end up with different water molecule structures is by changing the heat and the pressure. Yeah, this means that at certain pressures and temperatures, hot ice is a thing. This will cause the water molecule to change shape, and this in turn causes it to fit together differently with other water molecules. Are we getting this? I don't get it! Great. At 190 to 210 Kelvin, water molecules assume what's known as a rhombohedral crystalline structure. So, kind of like a box with slanted sides. 190 to 210 Kelvin, translates to about negative 83 to negative 63 degrees Celsius. That's cold. When ice two is heated, it will transform into ice three, which develops what's known as a tetragonal crystalline structure. The best way to describe this shape is like a prism, but that might not be wholly correct either. This is an example of the structure and it looks fairly chaotic. Ice four is a metastable phase where the crystalline structure adheres to more of a rhombohedral shape, but it's formed by heating high density amorphous ice slowly at pressures equal to 810 megapascals. Right, I guess we need to talk about pressure and non-crystalline forms of ice before we move on to these other ice forms, right? Cue the title card. While I did say that there are around 17 different forms of ice, that's a little misleading. What we are referring to in those 17 forms of ice are ones where the water molecules adhere to a crystalline structure. Some forms of ice don't, so really there's a bunch of different types of ice that are both found in the real world and in the realm of theoretical models. One such form of ice that astronomers, amateur or otherwise, are able to see right now is amorphous ice. Amorphous ice is actually found in comets, and it's formed in the vacuum of space where it's really, really, cold. This is also referred to as vitreous ice, and it's formed when liquid water is rapidly cooled. So rapidly, in fact, that it leads to the water molecules being unable to form any one crystalline structure. While we do find this kind of ice in comets, it's also thought that this form is probably the most common throughout the universe, and is likely to be found on dust particles in the interstellar medium. Oh yeah, I'm supposed to talk about metastable states, too. 
aren't I? Well, metastability refers to a kind of equilibrium where the stability is dependent only on small disturbances. Basically what this means is that the state of matter is mostly stable. Metastable solids usually only remain so for a very, very short period of time when compared to their stable counterparts. But that likely does not explain everything and can't, so let me know in the comments if you want a video explaining this in detail. Moving on, we have a monoclinic ice 5. A monoclinic crystalline structure looks vaguely cylindrical and is defined by three vectors. This form of ice is created by cooling water down to 253 Kelvin at 500 megapascals of pressure. I6 adheres to a tetragonal crystalline structure and is formed by cooling water down to 270 Kelvin and 1.1 gigapascals. And finally, we've arrived at I7. The big news about exoplanets, and probably more specifically, super-Earths, is that those that have the heat and pressure required to turn liquid into ice 7 could provide a vehicle for salts to be transported. Typically, ices expel any salts that end up trapped inside them. As we mentioned earlier, water molecules are extremely common in the universe, and it would also seem that ocean worlds vastly outnumber planets with drier atmospheres. Earth might have a lot of water by our standards, but it's still dry in comparison to ocean worlds. These worlds are hundreds of kilometers deep, leading to extreme pressures where these higher states of ice can be formed. In ice 7, water molecules take the shape of a cubic crystal system, but it's formed at pressures of 3 gigapascals and 350 degrees Celsius. That's 30,000 times the pressures we find at sea level on Earth at 15 degrees Celsius. And 350 degrees Celsius is extremely hot, although interestingly enough, Venus's surface is actually hotter. If you were subjected to such pressures, well, let's just say you'd probably die instantaneously. But hey, you're mostly water, so at least your final form would be that of ice 7. The now famous TRAPPIST-1 systems likely feature more than one water world where the conditions would be right for ice 7 to form. And the new study also suggests that GJ1214b, Kepler-62f, and E are also worlds to keep a close eye on. Salts are pretty important to life, and the scientists involved with this study weren't sure if they, along with other nutrients, would be able to move from a planet's core through a mantle composed of ice 7. The new model suggests that ice 7 is capable of retaining up to 2.5% of its weight percentage of sodium chloride crystals, and apparently this transportation effect from the core to the mantle to liquid ocean would be reversible. Ice 7 is a hot ice, which is a totally non-confusing concept now that we've gone through our crash course, right? Hot ices that exist at the bottom of a mantle would essentially be gravitationally unstable. This is due to the fact that hot ices are less dense. The paper suggests that this would cause I7 to rise and would lead to a global flow that would recycle nutrients and salts. Nutrients and salts that would be ideal for biochemical processes, i.e. Life. While this research does suggest the possibility that life could form on these planets, it does not mean that we're guaranteed to find it on worlds with mantles composed of ice 7. But considering that some of the moons in our solar system, like Europa, have conditions where I6 is possible, it's fairly promising. And while I6 is non-soluble, the presence of stained areas on icy moons has some scientists claiming that salt transport must be taking place. And if that's the case, that makes it even more imperative for us to investigate Europa, Callisto, Ganymede, and Titan. But what do you think? Do you think we'll find life on one of these ocean worlds, or do you think it's as unlikely as surviving in a block of ice 7? Let me know in the comments down below. If you dug this content, be sure to do all that algorithmic jazz and like, share this video with someone who loves exoplanets, and join our Discord community where you can meet other science nerds like you. And hey, check out all those wonderful names. Thank you, patrons. I'm Eric Malachite, and I'll see you next time, Space Cowboy.